Welcome to the Pod Pros series of Indian Podcasting Revolution. In this series, we sit across some leading podcast experts from across the globe to do some crystal ball gazing around the rise of podcasts. They share with us the tips, strategies, and the disruptive work they are doing in the world of podcasting. I'm your host and founder of Done for You Podcast, Roshni Baronia. And why wait further? Let's jump right in. When it comes to the topic of podcast monetization, brand sponsorships is one of the prime ways podcasters think that they can make money making podcasts. And the idea is probably an extension of the fact that traditional media has always been supported by brand sponsorships. But in the digital era, we have also seen Instagram influencers making crazy money deals with brands. But here's the catch when it comes to podcasts and brands. It is that podcast is an independent media. An individual who is the podcaster holds the IP of the content. And hence, there are some nuances to the way you pitch your podcast to brands for a paid collab. And there are certain details to keep in mind as to what actually are brands looking for when they choose to work with an independent podcaster. Thankfully, I have with me today Danielle, who has successfully monetized her travel podcast, working with brands like Citizen Bank, Motley Fool Stock Advisor, Tempe Tourism, Expedia, and many more. Danielle also works as a podcast marketing coach, helping independent podcasters monetize their shows through brand sponsorships. No wonder she's the one I'm talking to for the topic of the day today. So, Danielle, welcome to Indian Podcasting Revolution. How are you feeling today? I am doing fantastic. I am so excited to be part of the revolution and to share my insights and what I've learned over the last few years. So I'm really excited to be here. Yes. And now that you say that you have been into this space for a couple of years, so first things first, how did this podcasting happen to you? How did it occur to you as to podcast is the medium through which you want to share your travel escapades? Yes. Okay. So I have been a podcast listener for quite a long time. I can think back to the earliest being around 2014, 2015. And I was just so inspired by the travel podcast that I was listening to, the personal finance podcast that I was listening to at the time. And there was this little inclination inside of me that said, maybe I can do something like this too. But it took quite a long time. It took about like four years of just being a listener to actually get my show started. And when I was deciding on what podcast to start, it made sense for me to to really launch off of the existing brand I had, which was all about travel and personal finance. So instead of creating a new podcast with a new spin and really, really breaking up my concentration and separating my brand out, I decided to just focus on the thought card. And that became that became the avenue. So I would say if someone's thinking about starting a podcast today, if you already have content that you're creating, whether you're on Instagram or you're on TikTok or you're writing or you have a newsletter, lean into what you already have to establish your podcast versus starting from scratch and really splintering off your concentration. So that's a great advice that uh, you should hone in what you already are a master of and take that as a starting point. But then how did becoming a podcast marketing coach happen? Yes. So that has actually taken quite a while. So I've been podcasting since 2018 and we're in 2023 right now. Um, So that's what, five years. And it wasn't until I would say two years ago that I started to lean into the coaching aspect of podcasting. Despite me having a community called Women of Color Podcasters over the same five-year period, I never saw myself as a coach or as a consultant, even though I was doing coaching and consulting within my communities. So it took me a little bit of time to really step into the identity of coaching But when I started, I said, you know what? I want to start off with one-on-one coaching so I can really dig in and help to transform my clients' lives who really wanted to grow their podcast and grow their downloads. So I really started off with small one-on-one coaching, and I'm still doing one-on-one coaching because I really feel like that allows me to really get to know the client and help them craft a marketing plan that works for them. 
So it was gradual, but it took a little bit of time for me to step into this role. And I'm really happy that I did eventually. And it's so great that you are able to identify the similar problems that people face when it comes to podcasting, because I think growing the numbers and most essentially drawing up a marketing plan is something which early podcasters struggle with. Because like you said, even if someone is expert in their particular area or a niche, they might not be good in marketing or strategies to how to specifically market podcast. So talking about podcasters with a small show, let's say decent downloads of under 5,000 downloads per episode, what are the things they should consider before even thinking about reaching out to brands? What's the basic prep that is needed? Yes. So this is really important for you to take a step back and to ask yourself, are you interested in brand deals and sponsorships for the right reason? A lot of people are running to this because the industry says, okay, this is how you monetize primarily. But there's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into building relationships with brands, securing them as clients because they are your clients. You have to make sacrifices in terms of your content. You have to go through things like legal and paperwork and contracts. There's just a lot involved in sponsorships. So really first taking a step and saying, am I interested in working with a client in this capacity? Number one. And number two, do I truly intrinsically have an interest in pursuing this income stream? For me, when I am being approached by a brand, it typically goes a lot faster. They usually have a budget. They usually are excited to work with me. However, if I'm pitching a brand, I give myself something like one to two years of lead time. So if I pitch them today, I may realize a sponsorship deal a year from now or even two years from now. There is brands I've connected with who I'm still, four years later, we're still talking. We're still trying to find the right opportunity for us to work together. So it's definitely not a get rich quick, even though it is lucrative, it takes time. It's about relationship building. It's about putting yourself out there, pitching. You may not get a response back. What's your follow-up going to look like? Are you going to give up? Are you going to have self-doubt? Are you going to feel like negatively towards yourself that you did not succeed? So there's just so many avenues and aspects of it that go beyond the numbers. I feel like podcasters are so attuned with, I need to have 5,000, 1,000, 500 downloads per episode before I start to even consider this. And the question really is, are you willing to commit to creating this income stream and taking the time that it actually takes to realize? That to me is the more important question. Exactly. That's a good heads up that you have given that it's not only uh, about growing your download numbers, but also preparing yourself with respect to whether you are able to and first of all, willing to invest that much of time, effort and patience to hang in there for one year to get a yes from a brand. Because I do understand when anyone is working with brands or corporates or uh, organizations where there are multiple decision makers, especially in the marketing field where they have so many avenues for a brand to market themselves. Why should they choose a podcast? And that's when we have to like convince them, showcase them the profitability and the business use case for it. And that takes a lot of time. So you rightly said that if someone is intending to see this as an income stream for their podcast, they have to be prepared for this legwork as well. So do you think that if someone is finally making up the mind to go with brand sponsorships, is this something which they can invest themselves with as the income stream or they can have some other kind of income streams as well along with brand sponsorships? Yes. So I would definitely recommend to have multiple income streams as a podcaster, especially during these economic downturn times, right? There's a lot of thoughts out there that we are in a recession in the US or that a lot of companies are downsizing and the marketing budgets will follow. 
If you're solely relying on sponsors, you may be limiting yourself and you may end up realizing, okay, things are slow or quite literally there's nothing going on and you have no income coming in. So one of the things that I recommend to podcasters of any size is to consider affiliate marketing and affiliate revenue as a great foundation and a great layer, a foundational layer base. With affiliate marketing, you are referring products and services that hopefully you love and you enjoy and you really are excited to share with other people. And what, depending on if they click on the link or they actually make a sale, like actually purchase the item, you receive a commission. And for podcasters, I really try to recommend a staggered approach where you have your high ticket affiliate items. Meaning if you do make a sale, you're making $700, $800, $1,000, $2,000 per sale. And then also having the smaller ticket items like the $5, the Amazons, you know, associate programs that we're part of so that you have now both avenues. A lot of podcasters solely focus on the lower ticket and it's very hard to actually make a lot of income off of those smaller tickets because you need a lot of quantity. But with the larger ones, larger affiliate programs, you just need one or two hits to really make an income. So I definitely recommend start off and layer out affiliate marketing in there. Also with affiliate marketing, you are getting your audience prepared for what it's like when you work with sponsors. If you are talking about the products and services that you enjoy and you're like, hey, if you like it, you know, click on this link, purchase, and that way you support the show. And they hear you talking in this way. When you introduce a sponsor, you'll have a lot more buy-in from your audience because they're used to you talking about different products that you enjoy. And there's not this like, oh, I feel salesy or adsy or, you know, like this, like kind of sometimes we have a little bit of tension. So it's a great also, not only is great income wise, but it's just great to get your audience into the act of taking action and making a purchase. So it's kind of uh, giving them a teaser of uh, what it's like when you suggest or advise a product program or service through your show. And it's just warming them up to take action on whatever you are asking them to do. So that's a good way because then probably you will be able to give a better set of deliverable and link back to the brands who have actually invested money with you. So that's a great advice. And any specific guideline or best practices to follow when pitching to brand for podcast sponsorships and whom to pitch? Because like you said, that if someone is approaching the marketing department for an, of an organization, there are multiple stakeholders and decision makers. So how to approach them? Yes, absolutely. So first and foremost, before you even start to pitch, in my framework of how I approach brands, there are a couple of things that you have to do before then. You definitely rec- I definitely recommend having a media kit because this is really the document that whether it's a PR firm or brands, they're used to receiving this media kit. And this showcases what they need to know about your podcast and your brand to see if there's synergy and an alignment. So across the board, when they're evaluating all of the influencers and all the podcasters they want to invest in, they will be looking at media kits, typically speaking. So that's number one. And what I will say, I actually have a freebie. So if anyone is interested, I have a checklist for a media kit that you can review. And it's taken me years to put this together. What I want to say here is when you are talking to a brand and you pass them over your media kit and they provide you with feedback, take that feedback and improve your media kit. Your media kit is not this static documents, not like your resume that you just update once and that's it. It is a living, breathing document that you will go into to update your numbers and whatever a brand is looking for that's missing, go into back to your media kit and put that in there to create a more comprehensive media kit. So I think that's number one, really important. Number two, when you are ready to actually start approaching brands, before you just go ahead and click the send button, start to follow them on social, start to look at their website and review, okay, what 
are they focusing in, in on right now? What are their priorities? What are the gaps that you have identified that they're not covering right now that you can insert yourself into that conversation and say, right? As we mentioned, investing in podcasts is a marketing effort. It's an investment on their part. It's really better for you when you come up with an angle of something that you want to create for them or do with them versus just, hey, I want to work with you. I'm a podcaster. No, I want to work with you on summer travel with a baby. I realize that you don't necessarily have a lot of photos and conversations around mommyhood, right? And traveling to your destination, for example. So Try to figure out whether it's a gap that they're identified or something that they're doing currently that you can now attach onto and start the conversation. Something else to think about when it comes to pitching is that pitching is an introduction. It's opening the door, it's a handshake, and it's going to really continue to figure out what are they looking for and how you can best serve them. It's, you know, I find it really rare where you pitch a brand and they're like, here's the money right now, right? Because they don't know you. They don't know who you are. And you're really trying to figure out, okay, what's the story? What's the angle? What's the messaging? Is now the right time before you even get to the dollar amounts and the money? So really have your hat on and think about how can I help this brand and connect them to my audience in a way that's a win-win-win for everyone. The win for the brand, win for me as a creator and a business owner, and win for my listeners and my audience as well. So I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head by saying that, yes, you have to show the brand what's in it for them because uh, they are looking for a very specific outcome from association with the podcast and also what value you are driving for them. So it's not just about the content integration, but also about what value you can drive to them. It's not only the download number, probably, but specifically talking about an angle, like like you said, that summer travel with a baby. So talking about motherhood, bringing out that angle. So that's uh, beautiful. And uh, I'm sure you work with so many podcasters as a consultant and a coach now, helping them build up these brand kits. So Any common mistakes or goof-ups you've observed people do when they make these uh, media kits? Absolutely. So don't forget to include your imagery and your photos of you and your brand. So for me, as a travel podcaster, I have in my media kit photos of me traveling and me doing all the fun things that travel means to me. And that really pulls the viewer and the brand in. So don't forget to add your visual elements onto your media kit. If you have worked with other brands in the past, add their logos into a section so that they can see other brands that you've worked with. And this allows you really to acknowledge, okay, I've worked with other brands and here they are. So pull those logos into your media kit. A lot of times I see that media kits, they're either busy, meaning a lot of text on the page, or the colors and the fonts are too little. So really think about readability. So create your media kit or download a template or something like that, and then have someone take a visual scan of it to see, is this readable? Is there enough white space? You know, the formatting is very important, just as important as what's on the page, the content of the page. Other things that brands really care about, for example, is average downloads per episode. So typically as podcasters, we're gonna just go in and put our total downloads or a monthly download, and that's great, but that's for your entire archive. When a brand is investing money, they're probably gonna be investing in one episode or a few episodes. So to give them a realistic view of what it's going to actually look like to work with you, you want to give them the average downloads per episode. So this, if they know they're going to invest with you for two episodes, they know, okay, you're probably going to get 2,000 views or 2,000 downloads or 2,000 listens, right? Versus your entire archive, which may be 50,000, which doesn't really nail down and narrow down what's going on. Another thing that I see brands really looking at is your engagement rate. 
if you're pulling social aspects into your campaigns, make sure not only add your followers on your media kit, but the engagement of your posts, whether that's reels or stories or whatever the case may be, see what the engagement rate. And a lot of these um, social platforms just have them in the analytics. So you want to go in the analytics and pull those numbers because again, this gives the brand a realistic view of what it will be like to work with you and posting on your platforms versus just your follower count, which doesn't necessarily really mean anything. So these are the few things that really allow you to dial in and it limits the back and forth. When your media kit is not complete, they're going to come back and ask you questions and questions. And every time they come back with questions, it's slowing down your signing the contract and getting paid. So you really want to think about, put yourself in the brand's perspective. What do they care about? And continue to improve and add to your media kit so it's as comprehensive as possible. Wow. Those are some golden words. People do take note of uh, those (laughs) points. (laughs) Amazing. So uh, do you remember any such uh, conversation or negotiation that you've had with a particular brand and it stretched for a long period of time, but ultimately you did close the deal, but the entire haggling and to and fro, any particular episode that you remember? Oh my gosh. Mostly a lot of them. A lot. This is a, this can feel like a full-time job, to be honest. Exactly. Because there's just, a, there's so many things that go into the relationship building piece, right? Not only do you pitch, but maybe there's a meeting involved with the brand and then you send your proposal and then they have to review. And then, like you said, talk to their additional stakeholders and their bosses and their managers. So. A lot of what I'm doing is introducing myself to new people and new brands. That's part one. But following up too and just saying, hey, how are you? Just checking in to see how things are going or sharing with them a new episode that I feel like is really relevant that showcases how I could work with them in the future, right? So those are the things that I'm doing because it does take a long time. I will also say organization is so key as a podcaster. Because at any time, if you're juggling talking to five different people, you want to know where each person is in the conversation, right? So I have a spreadsheet where I track all my contacts. I track where we are in the negotiation process. And I also even put reminders on my calendar because sometimes what you realize is that these brands want to work with you, but they don't have the budget right now. So they'll tell you, okay, reach out to me in 10 months from now. And if you don't remember, you miss the opportunity, right? So have a way to track all of these conversations and then also add it to your calendar so you can actually go ahead and do the work to continue the conversation. Last thing I'll say about this piece is don't be afraid to reach out to your repeat, your repeat clients, meaning that once you sign a contract, you deliver it reach out to them again and say, hey, this campaign went really well. Is there anything else that we can work on? Or or what are you working on that I can support you with this year? It's so much easier for you to work with them again versus attain a new client, right? So that's something that I'm really dialing in this year is making sure I reach out to everyone who I worked with in the past, see how they're doing, how I can help, and see if there's any potential. Because they know what it's like to work with me, right? And they had great things to say. So let's continue, keep the conversation going. Amazing. So at any given point of time, how many accounts do you have open with respect to pitching, following up with them, and uh, just making sure that they are in the loop of having those conversations? So how many brands or accounts at any given point of time you're working on? I would say around five. Five sounds like a not overwhelming number for me. Again, I do this full time. This is my full time job, amongst other things that I do. So I have the capacity to really be engaged in these different conversations. But I also would recommend to think about any conferences and events that you go to. Because when you go to these conferences and events, you may meet a lot of brands and you get get back home with a notebook full of opportunities. So I really leverage these in-person conferences to 
make connections, meet with brands, and then use that as a launch pad to follow up and continue the conversation. So I would say five is a good number, but more, I think, easier for folks. Because if you're like, that sounds like a lot, right? Have a pitch day, whether it's every week, every other week, or once a month, where you spend an hour or two creating these pitch emails that you send out to potential contacts. So this allows you to always have new pursuits on the horizon, right? I would just say, have an hour, see how many that you can send out in an hour. And then next month, put another hour aside versus having this, like, I have to have five per month. No, think about just one hour of pitching for the month, send out those pitches and see what happens, see what happens as a result of that. So just, I think, importantly, is being consistent. I think one of the biggest things that I messed up at in the beginning was I would send out these pitches, I wouldn't hear back, and I would just feel like a failure. I would feel like, ugh, I suck at pitching, you know, like all these like negative self-talk, right? But there's so many reasons why a brand may not respond back to you. Maybe it went to their spam folder. Maybe they're just not interested or they're busy right now. So Yes, send out pitches, but follow up. The riches isn't following up because then you're making sure that you did everything that you could to get a response. Awesome. I'm suddenly feeling that I'm having an episode of my other podcast, Ace the Sales, where we are doing an episode of How to Pitch to Brands. (laughs) (laughs) So many golden sales tips and sales strategies here. (laughs) So, uh, so Daniel, this has been amazing to sum up. How can both podcasters and brands have a winning sponsorship association? Yes. So on the podcaster side, lead with the value. Lead with how you can connect your audience to the brand in a nurturing and a value first way. Again, creating these win-win-win scenarios, making sure that everyone who is coming together gets something incredible out of what you create. So that's part one. And then for the brand side is to really give podcasting a chance. I think that there's a lot of apprehension when it comes to podcasting because they only see downloads as a metric that they can track. But there are so many others, page views, listen time, clicks. You know, these are all things. Newsletter, you know, opens if you do a newsletter campaign. There's so many ways to track engagement in podcasting. But if you're only looking at downloads, you're just missing the mark and you're missing on real opportunities to connect with people. What I love about podcasting is this intimacy. It is so warm and you're having these one-on-one conversations or people are listening to you have a conversation with someone else. So it's very intimate. And there's some studies that have come out that says that people listen to podcasts mostly alone, whether that they're doing chores or they're going for a walk. It's, It's really like You have their ear, their dedicated time week after week after week. Find podcasters who understand your vision, understand where you want to go as a business and who care about, who care, you know, about what you're doing to create something amazing to present to these listeners. So I'm all in on a hundred percent on podcast sponsorships and the more creative you are, the better I found. In the industry, there's a lot of talk of CPM, which is cost per mil, where you get paid like $27 per thousand downloads. When you have a large show with thousands and thousands of downloads, this is a great model. It makes sense. When you only have a few thousand or a few hundred, it doesn't make sense. But it doesn't make your podcast less valuable or less worthy of partnerships and collaborations. So. Just some things to think about, but you got this. You can do it. You can do it. And, you know, tap into resources like this episode when you're stuck and you're looking for ways to continue to grow. Beautiful, beautiful words. And 
I think that should go up on the wall of brands that give podcast a chance, give podcasters a chance. So yes, this is definitely something which they should experiment with. So if any marketeers and brands are listening to this one, so yeah, here's something for you. And uh, last question, Daniel, where we do a little crystal ball grazing as to what is the next biggest change you would like to see happening in the podcasting space? I think it's metrics. So talking about different ways that we can measure our engagement with our listeners. There's also new features coming out like commenting. That's something that we need, right? It would be lovely for you to be able to comment as you're listening to an episode. And these are not crazy features that are impossible to create. We see them across the board on YouTube and in other mediums. So I think those are my crystal ball predictions is, okay, let's get our listeners to be less passive and engage them with features and technology like commenting, simple things like commenting and other metrics, simple things. Exactly. We should make it a little bit easier for the listeners to engage with the podcast there and there itself. I mean, podcasters don't need to ask them, go to Instagram, go to website, go here, go there to just talk to me. Exactly. <laughs> so you can talk to me back there here, like on the podcast. On the itself. app. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, yes. so yeah, that that's something we should be looking forward to in terms of what's coming next in podcasting. So thank you so much, Daniel, for spending your time with us and sharing such valuable insights. Thank you so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Hope this conversation helps you with your podcasting journey, whether you are an emerging or an established podcaster. For more such podcast insights, follow Indian Podcasting Revolution. And if you want help with the launch, management or growth of your podcast, check out our website www.dfip.in, which is the acronym for Done For You Podcast. Because you see, we like to keep things simple. And yes, if you wish to be a part of an exclusive podcaster community, join the waitlist from the link given in show notes. That's all for Pod Pros at Indian Podcasting Revolution this week. We shall meet again in the next episode.